Hello, Father. Hello, James. How are you? Hola, Kala. Hola, Kala. Finally. Yes. We've had a show. Thank you very much for uh, taking some time again. Uh, I, I appreciate it. How are you? Good. I'm well. I'm a little bit of a for a little conversation. <laughs> Yeah, I'm excited that I um, haven't been to Greece since 2015, about in July here, God willing, if my son gets his passport, we're going to go for about 10 days, my eight-year-old. Where? To Greece. Thessaloniki, Ceres, Athena, we'll be going. Uh, uh, yeah. If you come to Thessaloniki, we can meet if you like. Yeah, that, uh, that would be wonderful. When, when, when? Um, I'm planning uh, uh, June, end of June till about July 11th. Good. If you, uh, I can, I can send you my 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 mobile if you like, and we can, we can meet. Yeah, that would be wonderful. That would be wonderful. You know, I think uh, I got to see my grandma. I told her a year ago that I was going to come. Yeah, yeah, and she doesn't forget. She says, "Do I grab sacato, Tharthis?" So, uh, now with all the you know the travel with the vaccine stuff is all the you know behind us a little bit. So. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Good. Yeah. How's everything with you? What's new? Okay. It's okay. Uh, uh, like, uh, I'm coming from, from Sofia. I had, I had a, a conference there on mm -hmm. physics and theology. Oh, man. Physics versus theology was the title. Oh, wow. But, um, yes. It was with a template and foundation. Wow. It was good. Physics yeah. and theology. You actually uh, speak about that in at the end of uh, a Eucharistic ontology, where you talk about how. Uh, yes, you know, yes, I remember. Yes, I yes, just, yeah. just a few words. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would it be okay if we maybe got into that that topic as we discuss here? Um, uh, okay, as you wish. Uh, some others who perhaps are more important. Uh, you have a a, se a series of you have questions. Written questions. Uh, yeah, I do. Um, I think uh, since this time we went, last time we went through the book, Analogical Identities, the creation of the Christian self, I wanted to go through um, the Eucharistic Ontology book here. Uh, but there's so much there. It's hard to, uh, there's so much there that's exciting to me. I've been, you know, that, you know, I'm going to see what kind of emerges here. So I have some questions and we'll see how it goes, if that's okay. Good. Yeah, let's okay. start. Okay. And we'll see when we're going. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll do the intro here. Um, okay. So, uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. I have a very special guest with me today uh, for his second appearance uh, with me, uh, Father Nikolaos Ludovicos uh, from Thessaloniki, Greece. Father, thank you for joining me. I appreciate you. Thank you, James. Yes. Um, last time we um, discussed your new book, Analogical Identities, the Creation of the Christian Self. I've done a several videos reading through uh, a lot of the work there. I've had some great feedback. A lot of people that are in the postmodern um, Lacanian psychoanalysis orbit that aren't familiar with orthodoxy, they've started looking towards this book, and uh, I think it, it bridges a lot of gaps. Um, and before you wrote this book, I wanted to and why I wanted to have you on is to um, maybe talk through some concepts in your previous book, a Eucharistic Ontology, Maximus the Confessor's Eschatological Ontology of Being as Dialogical uh, Reciprocity. Um, when did you write this book, Father? Oh, this was my first book written actually more than 30 years ago, but wow. it was published in English in 2010. Uh, uh, the English uh, uh, edition is revised a little, and um, a new chapter. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me ask you: um, Why Saint Maximus? Well, Post, how did you come across his work initially? Uh, from your previous video, we talked about your past. You came from a, a psychoanalytic background, atheist. Uh, tell me when in, in your past did you come up across St. Maximus and what was uh, stood out to you initially? Um, Maximus is someone who, uh, in some sense, deals with a sort of ontology, if we can say so. 
Uh, but this ontology is not just a metaphysics in the sense that we, it is um, an ontology of a new sort, which saves somehow the ontological question. Um, um, but uh, it can be seen in a new way, not just in the sense that uh, what is that makes a being to be, but also what is the meaning of this being, which is uh, perhaps a postmodern, a modern postmodern question. In this, in this sense, Maximus speaks of uh, an ontology, not just in um, an abstract way, but uh, it tries to find how beings get meaning, how beings get meaning. This is why my reading of Maximus, which is, uh, yes, it is, it's a little, was accused and praised for this, and both accused and praised, in the sense that it is uh, somehow original and uh, personal. Um, uh, in this sense, this book is the first book where Maximus's ontology is linked with his doctrine on Eucharist. Uh, when you read the Maximian scholarship, you, you will realize soon that um, many, many authors say that it is almost impossible to form, to um, uh, synthesize, to uh, describe what Maximus precisely says in Eucharist, because his Eucharistic uh, passages are very few. So I wrote a whole book in order to prove the, the opposite, that uh, his uh, understanding of the logy of beings, that means his ontology, is uh, better understood when we read it through these uh, uh, few, as they say, passages, Eucharistic passages of his uh, work. But um, this was proved to be very fertile because I created a whole, a range, a whole, a whole range of meanings, as you, saw, if you, as you, as you see, uh, an ontology of communion, an ontology of uh, being, coming and communion, and a scatological ontology. And finally, understanding of this as something as dialogical reciprocity. Um, deriving from his Eucharistic understanding, for my Eucharistic understanding of Maximus's ontology, uh, based upon his um, this 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 eschatological uh, uh, description of ontology that he has, and which is based, as I said, upon the, the Eucharist. When we speak of Eucharist here, of course, we, we don't mean just Eucharist. We mean a whole. Uh, range a whole series of sacraments that culminates in Eucharist, in baptism, in Christian, Eucharist. and finally we mean the church. If I had described this book in a with only in French, I would say that this is the church as it it appears from 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 from, from the side of beings. Mm -hmm. What happens to beings when they entered when they enter the, the church? It's a phenomenology of the beings in the church. Uh, and in the same time, that forms, um, in a sense, an ontology, which is an ontology. Uh, of course, here yeah, we have to give some explanation because as this is what I, I remember, as I remember, I do in the first uh, chapter, the introduction, the introduction of the book. When I say that, when I speak of eschatology, we have two main trends in the West. The one who thinks that eschatology has to do with the authenticity here and now and nothing more. And the other which speaks of eschatology just like the end times that are going to come. For Maximus, when eschatology becomes ontology, that means that, that we have a combination of the two, that the end times, you know, make thing, things authentic by entering through this dialogical reciprocity in here and now, in the here and now of their history, you know, we we'll have an entrance, which is the, 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 the logy of beings. And then we have the, the dialogue, the response to this. And thus we have uh, the establishment of beings as in the way that wants, God wants them to be. Wants, wants them to become. It is like a becoming and, and in communion. 
but but uh, in a in characteristic characteristic way, um, it is essential to say that also human response to this is part of the mystery, which is to complete the Chalcedonian, as you know, comes from the fourth uh, ecumenical council, and uh, Maximus was a proponent of the fourth ecumenical council, as you know, the one in a sense who make it, uh, make, uh, helped us understand it on the anthropological level. Yeah, and also on cosmological level. Mm -hmm. So wonderful. Um, I, I think we can drill down a little bit on the term Eucharistic. Um, so in Greek, it's a colloquially, Ephraristo means thank you, right? So, um, and yeah. what came to mind was this idea of, uh, you know, Heidegger says that uh, thinking is thanking. Thinking is thanking. I love this phrase. Right. And that, and my, I, I also start, started from, I started Heidegger <laughs> in my youth. Um, look, um, I think that uh, Heidegger has some profound theological links, you know, and, 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 and sources back and back in his mind. Um, sometimes he admits this, but sometimes he just, we can just see uh, it be behind his thought. Uh, um, here we have uh, precisely the Eucharist as an event of the, as the utmost event of a dialogue. And we have to understand, and uh, some of those who agreed with this, uh, stressed it very much as a positive characteristic of this understanding. Uh, ontology, uh, Eucharist ontologically understood. Otherwise, we have a, a Eucharist just as I'm, uh, just remembering the, the, the past, you know, just a symbol of what has happened just um, as um, uh, say, um, uh, which is uh, in a way, it's not no more a sacrament. One can say we just remember what happened in the day. Um, you know, uh, Jesus was captured, and, uh, and he, you know, and, and what is important is that how someone paid. You know, this legalistic understanding, and we remember that he paid for our, our sins. Uh, Maximus understanding, and I think that many of the fathers. Uh, were behind him and uh, followed followed him on, on that point. You can say that Greek patristic understanding of Eucharist tends to be ontological in the sense that what matters is that something is given to 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 to, to, to man and man gives it in response back to God, and thus we have the fulfilling of its very being. You see, and it's uh, to use the word logos for this, Maximus. Says that God's um, things, uh, you know, things on the part of God, that His divine logi, you know, through His logi, He creates, He takes care, He sanctifies, He pours His wisdom, He pours His uh, uh, eternal life upon beings. Okay, as a uh, uh, very good uh, uh, English uh, professor wrote to me recently, I like this, he said. It's not that, that the ice, grace is not just the ice cream upon the pudding of, of a good boy, you know. You know, it is, we cannot separate things from grace. When we speak of things, we speak that uh, of, of divine grace lying behind of them and leading them well to the fullness of, of divine life. In this way, Eucharist is my way to facilitate this. I am offering this sacred creation this sacred matter, this uh, sacred body, and by by returning is this consciously back, thy known, we say in the Orthodox liturgy, from thy known we offer thee for all. All of them, all of them, katapanda, and for all that you wish to do with them. So in this way, consciously, and this comprises also asceticism, in a way, you offer <coughs> beings that you have received back to the one who has created. And in this sense, their being is fulfilled. They become, finally, God's appearances. It's, it's, it's like, this is why we speak in the of Eucharistic incarnation. 
in, uh, the, the mystery of incarnation is extended, not just repeated, we repeat a, 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 an event of the past. I think that this book is uh, um, one of those, um, I don't know if there are others, but uh, what I want to convey in this one, I want to convey, this is precisely this, the fact that in the world, uh, in, in the Eucharist, uh, the world is alive. You remember now Schmemann's work for, uh, for the life of the world, which is very uh, telling and very significant because it is the same line of thought in a way. Maximus um, uh, Schmemann did not dare to say that we can speak of an ontological meaning of Eucharist, but he means this. For the life of the world means precisely that it's not just a, a, a heavenly forgiveness that happened, an atonement. Okay, this happened, but what we have in Eucharist is, is the result of that. That means the active dialogue between me and God, dialogue between two wills, dialogue between two, 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 two acts, synergy, what I call analog, analogy in, my, in my, my work that's called analogical identities. And by the way, um, I have to announce the, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the second volume, Analogical Lens, is forthcoming. Mm. forthcoming. And uh, it, this is called Inner Meaningfulness. Mm -hmm. And this uh, Inner Meaningfulness, self catholicization meta narcissism, and Christian theology. It's, uh, it's going to be a three volume work. So, in this sense, we understand that the very anal analogy is synergy that means dialogue. Dennis de Ropagate speaks, speaks of analogy, analogy between two um, uh, 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 energies, between two acts. God acts, not just an analogy of essence. And I stress this in this book, mm -hmm. uh, comparing Thomas with Maximus on that point. Not in the sense that uh, when we speak of analogy of, of essence, we are wrong, but in the sense that it's much more passionate if you speak of the analogy of doing, doing things. Analogy of energies, of acts, uh, God acts, that means speaks. And uh, that means uh, we have two things, God speaking and acting and man responding to this. Responding in the sense that he has understood uh, more or less what God said. And then uh, through the, the, the whole life, the whole, the whole this exercise, the whole practicing of will, you know, it turns step by step to understand. Right? And uh, in this way, opens the field, opens the way to God to add grace upon grace, and understanding upon understanding. And so you can we have the life of the world, and we have things as God wills them to be. This is the, the secret behind this. Uh, ontological uh, uh, interpretation of Eucharist and Eucharistic interpretation of ontology. This is what I am doing in this book. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I'm trying. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, a, yeah. yeah. Well done. I think it's uh, it's a beautiful book, and uh, uh, I think that you know I've been reading a lot of Heidegger, the later Heidegger, and it seems to me that uh, this is more akin to a fundamental ontology, right? Um, where the <laughs> You know, he criticizes ontology for being, uh, you know, uh, missing the mark, amartya, essentially. At the very beginning, being was dawning on the pre-Socratic philosophers, and they started categorizing being as the uh, a category of beings, right? So it's just some quality that other beings share. And he's asking, what is a more originary, more fundamental understanding of being? And I think uh, this bridges the gap, and I think you do this and explain it beautifully with um, this understanding of of uh, bridging uh, a bridge that maps the transcendent and the imminent and glorifies okay. both appropriately, right? Both mm -hmm. are glorified. Um, cool. Yeah, I think it's a, it's, I think it's a wonderful, uh, I think it's a wonderful. Uh, you can see what is transcendent within the imminent. This is for me, what is important when Maximus speaks of the logi or well, um, uh, with energies, uh, about energies. That means that we have uh, transcendence within what is uh, what can I, can I call creation. In this sense, the very meaning of creation is uh, that lies within beings is at the very same moment in a sense comes outside, but it is inherent. 
It is a combination of Platonism and Aristotelism. Uh, Maximus actually goes beyond both in this sense. He does not say that, look, the truth lies outside. We can reach it. We have not the truth. He does not say that as Plato would uh, say. He does not say, look, uh, the truth of the beings are the beings, them, the beings themselves. We have searched for the ethos from the morphe, from the idea within beings. But he says, look, we have those things which are outside the ideas, the logi, within those beings, and in the sense, uh, and this is the way he explains the mystery of incarnation. This is we have incarnation after all. Incarnation is not something that is decided by God. Uh, you know, they just, this is another comment, very important to some uh, Western theological trends. Incarnation is not something that happens just before, be, because we need someone to teach us with the authority of a God. Not, not be, 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 before we need someone to pay for our sins. Incarnation is just with, diffu with an infusion of this, of all this life, so the logos who comprises all the logi within beings. In a way, this ontological understanding of incarnation is something that comes after the atonement, after the forgiveness. You know, <laughs> who could have forgiveness, Maximus implies, um, even without incarnation. We forgive, God, for, God forgives us everything, okay, in a radical way. But here, we have a step beyond. We have divine life infused. That means the uncreated logi in creation through my response become totally active. Well, because I accept creation as God's creation and I accept creatures as divine creatures by grace. Okay, they are here and now divine and I respond to this by using them as divine and by uh, asking God to reveal more and more this divinity. Okay, and this is done by the sacraments, first of all, by the Eucharist, which is precisely this change. And Maximus is very clear on that point. When we speak of ch change, we mean the change of the mode of existence. We do not, God does not change the essences of beings because he created them. He, he does not repent for the world that he created. So you have the world as it is. But as Maximus very um, uh, wisely says, that uh, says in this, in this point, natures are acted upon, act, can act, are acted upon beyond their limits. So you have bread and wine and body and blood of Christ in the very same moment through their mode of existence. You know, that means that as a matter of, as, as, as an event of exchange, you offer this, which is your life, and God transmakes them, okay, and what he is. We have the ontological explanation of Eucharist in this way, the very same moment, and the Eucharistic explanation of ontology. Um, at the same time. So, yes. Yeah, wonderful. I mean, it seems, uh, you know, let's let's uh, drill down a little bit in this idea of truth. And uh, it seems that this Eucharistic ontology gets beyond Plato by um, consummating the forms and the particulars. There's always this gap between the particulars and, and the forms. Um, so we can think of truth in terms of Western uh, ontology as a correspondence to uh, the forms or correspondence to yeah. facts and, and, and issues. Uh, what is uh, truth in this, uh, in, in this sense of a revelation? Um, that seems to be what bridges the gap, is, is reappropriating ourselves to truth as aletheia, as Heidegger would say, as this revealing, yeah. right? Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that's you, you comment on that and throughout your um, analogical book. And I think that's important. And I think my question out of this is, um, what is your the response to this? Because in the psychoanalytic um, community or these these different areas of postmodernism, it seems to be a solution to the very core of the problem of 
of psychoanalysis is this gap between self and other in a sense what is your reaction in this you know the atheistic let's say the lacanian community because you're a lacanian towards uh, your orthodox work um uh, yes um this 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 question is a little lecture in order to be to be answered uh, i think that what is important in lacan's perspective was precisely that he proved in a sense for which we meet uh, are absolutely convincing, while well, others are not so convincing, that we need the otherness in order to have a constitution of, of the I-ness of the, of the self. Uh, we do not just use the other, but in a sense, we are also used by the other, in the sense that uh, the other is absolutely active in us, unconsciously active. We do not choose the others. Buba would say, for example, I, thou, you know, we need the I, we need the thou in order to have the I. No, it, that means that it's a matter of choice. I ch choose to have the other because I want to have myself. And then, uh, uh, in a sense, we're not far, one can say from Kant, when Kant says, you know, you need this, the, the imperative, this Kantian imperative that you, you, you have to act in this way in order to get a, a selfhood. <coughs> um, um, and, and acting like if the others, uh, as, uh, you know, what you do, it has to be become, become a law for all the others. So in a sense, you include the others in your action, but here you are included in the action of the others. This is the opposite in a sense. But Lacan could not describe how this can happen consciously. So what for Maximus, it is important that as a Christian has in mind also his mystery of the cross. You see that in a sense, you have to create a place for the other. When he approaches God, he understands that he is a full of narcissistic desires. He knows this, don't, let, don't forget, uh, let us not forget that we, he, he wrote, he wrote the chapters, the four chap, 40 hundred chapters of love, which is the, uh, the narcissistic handbook of the ancient Christianity. Precisely this. And one, what is, why do we need to deal with love with such a, in such a detail? It's precisely because of this, we have to, have to clarify a way we approach God and the others. Eh? Precisely in order to have the real God, the real other, the, the, the other and other, as I, I call it, in my uh, own life. And uh, that means that this dialogical reciprocity of which Maximus speaks is a reciprocity which is different from the uh, Sanocalitic reciprocity where, 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 where I cannot get rid of my narcissism. And finally, in a more realistic way, as I I don't know if we, we spoke about that in the in the past. Koch uh, is right when he says to you, "Okay, just use the other. Let the other use you." This is the, the really no. Here you are trying to make place for the other. So God speaks, and that means that He proposes things. So in order to accept them, I have to get out from my philaftia, from mm -hmm. myself, love. Philaftia, as you know, the Greek word philaftia, philia to have to. I'm friend to myself. That was what, what, what's good. So you, you're getting out from this, you make a place, you give place to God. And he, uh, he, he lets him speak to you and you're trying to get the meaning of what he says, not just to project your meaning upon things. In a sense, you, see, you, 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 you try to, um, uh, to uh, what is the word, to ensure, in, uh, Created syntonizo uh, is the word. You know, create the same tune. Mm, like a harmony, symphony. Yeah, harmony. <laughs> harmony, another group word. Tune, another group, tonus. <laughs> we use Greek words on the two. So it, it create a harmony with, with, between your understanding of, being, of beings and his understanding of beings. And in this way, you allow him to speak to you. You know, mm -hmm. the great problem between, uh, you know, if you compare, for example, Heidegger and Maximus is precisely on that point. 
This is why in another writing when I speak of an, an logical ecstasy. While in Heidegger, you know, which is important to hear what Bing says. Okay, you are giving an account on what Bing said to you, but no one knows if this is Bing that talks to you eh? or in a psychoanalytic perspective, it's just you that you imagine what Psychosis. Bing said. Psychosis, eh? right? Psychosis. This in the, in, in the very end can become a psychosis. Then yeah. that means the absolute melting with the other. The absolute melting with the other is psychosis. You know, it's paranoia. It's paranoia. But uh, uh, okay, the philosophy thinks that being speaks to him. But how can you prove this when you are left with a narcissist? When mm -hmm. you just you make just, just projections, that 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 be a good Freudian Lacanian question. How do you know this? How do you know that the other is the real other? Well, Lacan the says other. the the other the big other doesn't exist, and I think Orthodox would agree. The small I other. think from an Orthodox perspective, the big other doesn't exist, and I think there's the, and I think the difference and I think the solution comes from the uh, apophatic nature of Orthodoxy and its distinction. I think is important um, because this merging with the big other is is narcissism, is philoftia, right? Even the melting of the small others can be philoftia, yeah. perfect philoftia. And the, the word that came to mind was, I have written here, philoftia versus, and this is, I wanted to get your take on this word, philotimo. Philotimo is, is the attitude within dialogue that I think it, that brings one towards this um, emptying of the self. Absolutely, it's it's a Greek word, which cannot be uh, translated easily in other languages, you know. And uh, but I think that you're right because I forgot to do with gratitude. Uh, I, I was uh, ready to say this: uh, Why do you this? The, the, why is is uh, why do you uh, ch choose this way of 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 of, of a dialogue? You know, it's out of philosophy, it's out of gratitude, in the sense that you have the other. God or the others, you know, giving you this dimension of communion which fulfills your existence. So, and for for this for, for this way, all of these people are all God Himself are benefactors in a sense. So you react by giving them place through and because of gratitude. So this self-emptying is not just a self-emptying which is the uh, say the uh, as Laplace would say the sadistic part of uh, uh, the 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 masochistic part of a sadistic invasion. No, it is precisely the way of uh, acting out of gratitude in the sense that you uh, return God's benediction, you return God's um, uh, infusion of divine life or uh, the, the existence of the others which gives meaning to your, to your own quest of meaning. Eh? And in a sense, you create a, a place for all the others. And in the sense, you leave them act in yourself. You leave them talk, you leave them talk. And you're trying to create a harmony between your response and his, and then, this goes on and the others give you new opportunities, you react in, in a new level. And in this way, according to Maxwell, we learn what love is. This is the most important thing. In order to love the other, Maximus says, for example, you have to think of nothing bad of him, which is strange psychologically. How can I? Uh, prevent myself from thinking anything bad for any. And he says this very emphatically. He says, if you think of anything bad uh, about any human being, you are totally alien from what God's love is. Whether it's been love in its essence, which is, as I said, that a very strange declaration of, of, from a psychological point of view. That means you give the other the absolute. Uh, for in a sense, to, and, and, and you, 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 you make him innocent of anything that he's not innocent of, you know, in a sense, 
if I speak, can I can speak so. He's not innocent, he's, well, he's guilty, but you make him innocent. Mm -hmm. In a sense, you, in, in a, some, some way, you, you see him as, as, as the work of, of the Holy Spirit, as what God wants him to be, to become. And Maxwell says that this is the, the, way, God, uh, the way God sees us. The Holy Spirit sees us. Oh, I lost you a little bit, Father. I think your mic, I lost you a little bit at the end. Uh, where? No, I got you. I, yeah, it, I, the mic cut out, but I got you again here. Um, mm -hmm. So I got you. Uh, I guess a question that kind of came up is, um, yeah, we all can have the intention to love our neighbor as ourselves and even love our enemies. Where does the inclination to not love our neighbor as ourselves, it comes from the unconscious, right? What, where is the unconscious? So just uh, quickly, I did a, a deep dive into the history of modern psychoanalysis, and I really saw it, its origins in uh, Descartes in terms of its modern instantiation of I think, therefore, I am. <clears throat> I think I can doubt everything except that I'm thinking is the creation of the modern unconscious because it takes all the forces uh, that are outside of our awareness of me thinking and it puts them outside of, uh, outside of my consciousness. So the unconscious yeah. is created. So I have the intention to love my neighbor as myself and I have my intention to love my enemies, but I can't do it. It's very difficult. And uh, I'm jealous and I'm, uh, you know, I'm coveting, you know, uh, and of all these things. Um, and that's deeply rooted in the, 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 uh, the unconscious in a sense. So how do we, you know, how do we work through that? It's like, I wish I could love everybody as myself. And I wish I could love even my enemy. Life would be a beautiful thing, but I can't, you know, what I can't. Uh, um, these are very, very serious questions. In a sense, this is the question of what, the unconscious really wants to ask from us. Mm. <laughs> this is you have to read them the unconscious in, in, in this in this way. Uh, I think that's for Maximus the answer. Uh, I don't know I, if it's a clear answer, but the fact that he deals with such a detail <clears throat> for all these presuppositions of love. Okay, it is as if he tries to show that. To love the other is what you really and, uh, in a sense, um, deeply in your in your in your existence want. Mm -hmm. in, 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 yes, in this in this sense, um, he says to you that you have to struggle. This mm -hmm. is the mystery across. Asceticism, mean, right? Yeah, That's asceticism. The citizen, a psychologist, and especially the American psycho ego psychology, as mm -hmm. Lacan describes it, well, people as like uh, even Yalom, like Carl Rogers, cannot speak of this, that they do not understand this, this um, struggling. I mean, in the sense that, uh, yes, I want to love it, I cannot. And I cannot because, but I want it. This is sound, but uh, the fact that I do not, I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm unable to do this. But at the very same moment, I want it so, 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 so deeply. So there is a way, this is what Maximus says, to do this. And, and the way is precisely to learn how to love. To learn, this is a science for Maximus. Mm -hmm. And he spends pages and pages <coughs> in order to teach it to you <coughs> step by step. And this has to do again with Eucharistic ontology in the sense of all this reception of, of things that you have, you receive day by day, and of this of gratitude and all these things that, these things that uh, 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 come to your life from above, from the others, from, from, from. And in this sense, you just return, uh, you give back, uh, what they have given already to you. In the sense, Maximus says that, in the sense that you are re the result of a deep and un unconditional love. That you were loved just for yourself. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And just a work of God. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
God loves us according to Maximus and other, other <coughs> patristic authors, not because he wants something from us. It is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in another book of mine, uh, which was published between the two, um, um, it is called uh, Church of the Making by St. Vladimir's Press, which is the ecclesiology, the ecclesiological part of all these things mm -hmm. that we're talking about. Is that in uh, English? Is that English translated? Translated, yes. Okay. It's, it's, it's Vladimir's Press, 2016. Okay. And a Ecclesiology of Consubstantiality, which is okay. the... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm familiar with it, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So in, uh, in a chapter of this book, I study precisely the meaning of selfhood in, concerning the doc doctrine of creation. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm trying to analyze, again, Maximus's uh, uh, meaning of logi, comparing it with Maximus, uh, with, with uh, Plato, with Aquinas and others. And I'm trying to say that, in a sense, the fact that logi for Maximus are not ideas <clears throat> means that they are immediate switch, uh, turning of his will. Look, what I, I want to say. If uh, God has paradigms or ideas in his mind. Then he thinks things first, he thinks of things, and then creates easily and all and quietly, you know, the world. If he does not have, has, if he does uh, not have ideas in his mind, as in Maximus, but only wills, that means that creation is precisely what we can call love at first sight, mm. I mean, which is very important. It, it, the way of creation, according to Maximus, does not mean that God quietly decides to create beings. No, but he turns with love, this is love at first sight, toward nothingness, like this. Tuck. He sees nothingness. And when he sees nothingness, nothingness stops to, become not, to, to be nothing, nothingness, mm. to creation. So in this sense, it is strange to say, but creation was created for its own sake. As you love at first sight, not because you want to use someone, but, but because you, 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 you are absolutely attracted by that someone, okay? So somehow God is attracted by the possibility of nothingness to be everything. Mm. Yeah. You know, and in a sense, he opens himself this in, in this immediate way to uh, nothingness without having thoughts, in a sense, to uh, play with this, to work with this, in the sense uh, that he wants to, ex to to experiment, you know, to make, uh, you know, and, and, and do things and see that what this works, how does this thing work, uh, how can we, uh, you know, um, apply this or that on this new thing, which is creation. Okay, so he turns with love, and this is creation. So not 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 logismo, logi. Logismo would be, you know, uh, if he was, he's not he's not it's doing will, a scientific will 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 will. Yeah. Not will. a scientific experiment, a poem. He More wills like poem. nothingness. So suddenly, he wills what is in a sense, exterior to himself, which is not exterior, nothing is exterior, but he, he just suddenly is not God. And in this sense, he creates another God. Mm -hmm. it, you know, it's very important to stress this, which is, I, I, I try to do this in this book, uh, 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 Caputo's uh, terminology. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just the hora. That, uh, that it already exists in a platonic way that, that God puts things upon this, builds things upon this. It's the fact is that creates Korah himself. Mm -hmm. Creates the container too. Yeah. Yes, absolute intention, which creates precisely because of this another intention. Mm. God creates what is unbelievable, according to this book. Yeah. Another intention which can absolutely be, be godlike. So this is the base of our. Big gratitude, great gratitude. The fact that he creates us equal to himself. This is what the image means according to the fathers. From Marineus to Maximus the Confessor. Yeah, that's he second, creates, yeah. He sees, he sees us as his equal. He creates another intention, absolutely free, as is his own intention. 
he creates what is indeed unbelievable. Every other sort of creation would be just a submission, you know, some, mm -hmm. yes. And, um, and um, uh, I, I, that would be not so attractive. For, for example, I feel I'm full of, I, I wanna, before I read uh, Switch Theology, I when I, it's time when I was reading Plato, I, I remember this melancholy in, in, my, in my mind. In, in, in these things, in, in this way, in, in, in the Platonic way, things are decisively inferior. And Plato is, uh, you know, reminds us of this uh, in every step, in every step. We are not, uh, you know, uh, godlike. Even, you know, you, you know, just we are just uh, things are corruptive, you know, in corruption, you know. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, the only way to do away this, with this is just to leave things and return to God's, to the God's world. Very so, Gnostic, right? Very Gnostic understanding. Right? And, but in this case, in, in, in Maximus's case, in the case, it seems that we are part of his, not part in, in an essential way, but part of his love, part of his self, uh, 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 not self self uh, uh, you know not his essence but part of his way of understanding himself you know <laughs> not in the sense with, that we are necessary but in the sense which uh, can be revealed in a um, great human love for example yeah i think that's beautiful yeah. and the term yeah. understanding right it, it's not understanding to me is hypostasis hypostasis is similar yes gives gives hypostasis to nothingness as we give hypostasis to those who are in love with. You know, not because the other, when you see the, you know, I, I, I had a student, I had a student once and uh, sometimes he came to me and he wanted to, 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 to uh, introduce um, uh, his, his girlfriend to me. He said, look father, he, this girl is wonderful. This is, you know, it's something that has introduced me to new words of understanding things and whatever. And the girl was just a, job, a common girl. But at the very same moment, it was the, this invaluable being. Mm -hmm. In a sense, this is the way, the way it looks at us and he never gets bored of us. When you love someone, he's always new. Mm -hmm. And you see that God never identifies human beings with his sins or with his fault. Mm -hmm. He always, and the world, he always see him as promising, as developing, uh, as flourishing. And this mystery of the selfhood of, 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 of us and the selfhood, if we can say, of the world, uh, is something that is established through the Eucharist. You, because God's established a dialogue. He creates you out of nothingness and then in this um, immediate turn to you. He does not uh, wonder if you are worthy in the sense that, let's see now, what have we done here? Let's count, let's, let's see, let's examine. Mm -hmm. eh? No, but he gives it, he gives it, he gives it, he gives it, he gives it. He, he gives himself. Mm. He infuses his own life to you. So, in this sense, ontology is fulfilled uh, eucharistically in this final dialogue because he uh, awaits, he waits for your intention to respond. Mm -hmm. you like the, do you like what we're, I'm doing now? Do you like what? Let, let's do it together. Mm -hmm. let's, let's, that he teaches you what? His very mode of existence, the emotion, the way of uniting everything. As he's united. And that's consubstantiality to me. Okay, precisely. This is today we have the, 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 the Pentecost. Okay, what is the Pentecost? In our sinan, let, let everything be, become one. You know, and um, in this sense, this is the very uh, experience of the church. Because church is precisely the very uh, meaning of, of, of creation in this sense to, to spread his own way of, of living upon creation, upon nothing else. To yeah. become one, but also preserved in our identity. 
Right. If, if in order to become one, you have to preserve your identity. Otherwise, it's just melting. It's yeah. not one. You become like a moksha or nirvana, which is you know yes. blowing the flame out. So they, they, they have one essence, which is either given uh, timelessly, but they are precisely of this. They are, they are three. The perfect donation, the perfect given, means that you are you have a self in order to to, to give. Eh? Mm -hmm. And 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 the, the, you you make um, also the other uh, an absolute other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're absolutely other because you give, and you're absolutely other, other because you receive. Yeah, beautiful. So what is the relationship between uh, nothingness and eternity? Nothingness and eternity. Yeah, because so we come from nothingness, we're created out of nothingness. Is the goal then, or is the, the telos to join, become part of the body of Christ, the body of God in, in eternity that pre-exists nothingness? You know, we're in time. What is miraculous and what is, uh, you know, fills us um, of joy, of this great uh, ecclesial joy, is precisely that though we are nothingness, and uh, in our essence we are precisely nothingness, God gives us his own life. Mm -hmm. His uh -huh. own life. And that means he gives us all his knowledge, all his attributes. You know, Christianity is very bold. Very bold. It's the boldest spiritual event that ever happened on this earth. Nowhere is it possible to find this. To find a spirituality when you leave something behind because it's wrong, yes. We have Platonism, we have Hinduism, we have everything. Another spirituality which teaches you that everything is full of pain, so leave it apart and never desire, you know, and stay as you are calm and you know that. It's another human invention. Mm -hmm. Say that God is a very angry being and wants just to be praised and uh, you have to ask, you know, in a uh, total humiliation or amor fati, uh, mm -hmm. you know, to, to just to, to, to make him, to, to calm him down. <laughs> it's also a human invention. But mm -hmm. to say that, God looks upon nothingness with love and creates out of nothingness a new intention. It does not stop here, but it gives himself absolutely to his own intention. But because the precisely this is Christ, human intention, God's intention in one. And wants to create uh, an eternal dialogical reciprocity with this. And then this is the absolute love. And the, so, so much human depression can be cured. Mm -hmm. We understand this. If it, 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 is a, it is a joy without limits, indeed, believe me. I met this joy when I was in some, in some, in some Christian ascetics. And in a sense, um, that was one of the reasons, a very strong reason, this eternal joy that they had. Mm -hmm as if death does not exist, because death does not exist in this, in this, in this case. Just, death is just an event like this. Um, it's a, 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 a moment, you just cross a tunnel and nothing more. Life is, continues, absolutely. And then everything is restored because God does not repent of matter, you know, because, because for, for, the, for the matter he created for the, your body and you are an embodied, decisively embodied being. So that means that you are the real other for God. If you have your body, he does not want to excarnate you. Mm -hmm. If we can say this word, use this word. And in this sense, this is joy. I mean, a uh, uh, man has not, was never able to invent such a thing. Mm -hmm. It cannot be invented by, by a man. Uh, it's uh, impossible for most wild dreams, you know. <laughs> he, uh, trying to invent that is the problem. And I think, uh, you know, um, something that came to mind is this, uh, when we were talking about Lacan earlier, the master, master signifier is this self-naming that we see in Babel, right? Trying to name ourselves, take on the name of the father, in a sense, uh, which is, which is uh, impossible to do. Um, but uh, the question I have is, 
what how can we think nothingness does not mean the vacuum it doesn't mean the void right and when god was in genesis god was hovering over the face of the deep uh nothingness is a type of chaos i missed i missed a couple of words Mm -hmm. um uh... oh they cut out a little bit on me father Are you there? Can you hear me? Hello. You had this. Uh, we had an uh, an interruption here. Yeah, no problem. I paused it. Uh, I paused it immediately, so I just started it again. But we're okay. And um, this is precisely the reason. So well, yeah, I mean, I really yeah, I love this conversation, uh, and I. Um, maybe we can, you know, with a little bit, you know, time you have left. And again, I appreciate it. And I guess this goes with the question I was just about to ask you, um, this nothingness that, uh, we talk about here, it's not the void and it's not uh, a vacuum. Um, and it's related somehow to Genesis when God was hovering over the face of the deep is the deep, this nothingness that we're created out of. And my second um, part of that question, and then we, the second part of that question is, how did this relate to maybe you, before we started recording, you talked about, you t- gave a talk on physics and, and uh, theology, right? Yeah. So I think there's a, at the bottom of physics, we see that there is nothing. There's strings, there's, you know, filaments yeah. or whatever it may be. So first part of the question, how can relate nothingness to the face of the deep in Genesis? And how does that relate to maybe if it does to your talk on physics and theology? Um. Look again, we need perhaps um, a whole lecture uh, to reply to these answers, to, to, to these questions. Look, uh, first of all, uh, when, when a theology speaks of nothingness, does this, uh, uh, it, it does not mean by this that in a sense, nothingness is an uh, ontological absolute. Nothingness is ontologically absolute which is different. That means, and this has been proved in a sense um, by philosophers so different uh, between them, like uh, uh, Bergson Bergson, or Hegel or Heidegger, that in a sense, uh, when we speak of nothingness, this is not nothingness because you need, uh, as Bergson says, for example, uh, you need to have in your mind being and then make an abstraction. So you're thinking of, of being two times in a sense. Mm-hmm. And say that this is nothing, nothingness. So human existence does not know what nothingness is because we do not the way which comes from nothingness to existence. We are unable to do this, and this way, in this way, we are unable to think of the total nothingness. Mm-hmm. We don't know what is this. That was made by God. Okay, and in precisely for this reason, it is impossible for us to think of nothingness because we were never there. Mm-hmm. And then, mm-hmm. Yeah. Not, you know, that, that, that makes sense is about as much as, as it in can. In a sense, for Maximus, uh, this is included in our existence in the sense that we came from it. Mm-hmm. Maximus uh, uh, understands sin precisely in this ontological way. You cannot go to nothingness because you don't know the way back, but you include it. And in somehow when you commit conscious sins, it, it is as if you try to go back to nothingness from which you came from, as if. And this is the ontological catastrophe caused by sin. Mm-hmm. That you, you know, somehow you try to realize, to bring back nothingness. So, and establish it within beings. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. uh, speaks, uh, physics speaks of a nothingness. Uh, which is, we can say, a mathematical nothingness. 
Okay, well, which is different? Absolutely different, nothingness. My glass has no more coffee or water. No, okay, this is, okay, the mathematical quantitative uh, nothingness. Um, it is important to understand this, that theology uses this category um, while at the very same moment knows that this cannot convey the meaning of mm. mathematics because no one knows nothing except for God. No, only God knows what math nothing is. In another uh, language, we can perhaps say that nothingness is what is outside God. Okay, but even this is not accurate. What is outside God? outside of his existence. Nothing. This is nothingness. In a sense, we can say that uh, only God knows what nothingness is, but we know it each time we have some psychological or uh, philosophical problem or the moral problem. Now, for example, we are in danger, we have this uh, war in, in, in Europe, okay? And we all know that there is a possibility that this world, this world can turn to a third world war and become a nuclear destruction where somehow the very existence of human beings and uh, of Earth uh, are at risk, okay? So in this sense, we smell this nothingness. Mm. You know, this smacks of nothingness. And uh, of course, this is this is not God's will because God created beings out of nothingness in order for them to exist beyond nothingness. Mm -hmm. okay. But nothingness is nonetheless, you know, included by existence. When, when we want to live by by our own through our own power, you know, the danger of nothingness is in here, in, in, is in there. It's inherent in our existence. This is uh, much more uh, perhaps understandable in the psychoanalytic, psychological, psychotherapeutic uh, experience. When you see this nothing, it's basically through depression. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, in, in a sense, depression is precisely this, the uh, giving hypothesis to nothingness mm. in, on a psychological level. Mm -hmm. And um, um, Many people suffer from, from depression and would say that at the very same moment, they suffer from a lack of meaning. Mm -hmm. A philosopher can suffer from a lack of meaning, but this can be corrected. Uh, a man who has entered depression cannot correct this mm -hmm. anymore. And he needs, you know, medicine, he needs, he needs some, some uh, uh, chemically assistance chemical assistance for this. And uh, um, that means that a uh, human being is destroyed by nothing. Mm -hmm. Even biologically destroyed by nothing. And many things that happens in our lives, take heart attack, take diabetes, take, you know, everything. Through all these things, we see nothingness invading our lives. Okay. And finally, it's... Uh, uh, the corruption, which is called death. And don't forget that for the uh, created experiences, experience, church, uh, death was not absolutely necessary from the beginning. Death could be avoided. Okay. Could be avoided. In, 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 in a sense, all beings are created, are, you know, um, according to the second thermodynamic axiom, you know, everything has to be, you know, entropy, you know, everything has to finally dissolve. This is the natural, uh, uh, somehow, uh, net, network, this is the, the, nat the, nat the natural, somehow, uh, um, uh, texture of beings, okay. But some, some, some in, 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 in some time and in a certain moment, God proposes something different to a logical being. Adam knows that everything is perishable. 
He has seen things dying. He knows that death exists. And now he's in an absolute encounter, personal encounter with God. And he receives a proposal. Can you, do you like to live forever? You can do this if you follow this and this and this. And of course, we know this symbolic narration. And you know, someone tells you, you know, you have to learn good and bad in order to, to achieve this. And that means you have somehow to deal with the with nothingness, with, with zero, with uh, yourself alone. You see, but God says to Adam and Eve, don't deal with nothingness alone. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember now over Nietzsche uh, saying when we say that when you look at the abyss, be careful because the abyss is also looking at you. This attraction of nothingness, that nothingness can be everything in the sense that it's open for any possibility. This is what devil says, says to, 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 to Adam. Mm. When yeah. you go back, you everything, every sort of possibility will be yours. You, you, you will be able to choose yourself. And then that, that's you, 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 you will become God. But what is true is that if you look back and if you see this, you have to be able to understand what is the meaning of nothingness and what is the meaning of the fulfillment, fullness of life. If you don't know the second, it is dangerous to look at the first, because you can take the the, 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 the former, the, the look looking at the abyss, as the full possibility of having, you know, uh, uh, the fullness of wisdom of life. You understand why? You have mm -hmm. all the possibilities in a sense, but you don't have life. Mm. You understand? Yeah. You know what? Uh... You, have you have. It is a philosophical problem that they will put to Adam. I, I uh, you know what came to mind here? It's it's also a technological problem because this um, being alone with nothingness reminds me of the metaverse that we're you know you're going to have virtual reality. You know yeah. we're moving towards the metaverse and this yes, yes. idea of the technological singularity where the the actual you know, we're moving towards this the technological singularity. Yeah, yeah, that which is nothingness, which is which is out of the fear of death. You know, uh, fallen man is approaching his mortality to be immortal through computers, through digital zeros and ones, which is nothingness in a sense. Um, so it, that's what kind of came up for me. You know, when you, when you're in virtual reality, right, you can create any avatar you want, any kind of virtual body. You can be a dinosaur. You could be a, you know, whatever you want to be Let and you're, me and you're to by yourself example. and you're by yourself. This the, yeah. This is what the devil said to Adam. Mm -hmm. That was a temptation. And, um, Again, again, I have uh, some phrases of the fathers when I'm saying all these things. Um, he said to Adam, look, you can create yourself again. This is uh, the meaning of knowing bad and good. Mm -hmm. You have all the possibilities by yourself. Do not obey. Do not discuss with him. Because he is an existence that has somehow all the possibilities in him in the sense that he created himself. He, you know, he is fully, uh, he's fully uh, 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 self-dominated, if you can say so. But you are dominated by him because you don't have the meanings, the initial meanings, the initial absolute possibilities. It was indeed a very deep problem. And Adam was not able to solve it without. If, 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 if he was in, in, in dialogue with God, so he would perhaps say, look, I'm, in a sense, want to see the fullness of life first and then see if um, this somehow fulfills my existence by having everything, what God, God has by essence, have everything by grace and through grace. So in a sense, he, then he could... Hello. You there? This, this happens regularly here when we have uh, storms. I don't know why. Father, we're 3,000 miles apart, so uh, I'm grateful for it. Uh, <laughs> I'm surprised it doesn't happen more, you know. Uh, you got five, ten more minutes? 
Yes, yes, we have absolutely. Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. I, and we don't have to get into this topic. It's a little sensitive right now, but since you brought up uh, this, uh, you brought up the you know the conflict in Ukraine and Russia. So the last year and a half, I've been reading the work of Alexander Dugan, his philosophy. Oh. Yeah. Now I just want to know what uh, you know. He says that uh, you know that Russia is the catacomb, catacomb, which is this the 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 barrier to the fullness of the son of yeah the fullness of the son of perdition. He says that the Byzantine empire empire for a thousand years was the catacomb, right? And now the final catacomb left is uh, the Russian Orthodox Church, so to speak, right? Um, and he, and I'm reading him, and I've read his. Uh, his understanding of, of Christianity. He's very well versed in the fathers, very, very well versed in uh, or Orthodox theology. His explanation of the Dormition, the icon of the Dormition of the Theotokos, uh, he's, he gives this symbolism. You know, it's the only icon where the mother of God is an infant and Christ, you know, is, is, uh, is, is, is grown, right? It's the, the opposite of the usual depiction of the Theotokos where she is uh, an adult and she has the baby Christ. And he says that the beginning of materialism is where you have the mother of God and a little bit of spirit in Christ, right? He says that the, the inverse of that is when Christ reigns. So matter does not get diminished. Matter becomes put, be put in its place, right? And matter is, is represented by the, the Theotokos, right? So when Christ reigns, matter is appropriately situated in, in the hierarchy, in a sense, and there's a lot there we could talk about, but just general thoughts on, on Dugin. I don't know how familiar you are. Look, uh, you have to read Dugin. Uh, uh, along with, and uh, in parallel way with Svetlana Leksievich. How do you spell that, Le Leksievich? Alexievich. Okay. Alex. The, the, I think that the, the English title of her book is Second Hand Time. Second Hand Time. Okay. Uh, this is a Nobel, uh, Svetlana is a Nobel winner of 2015. Nobel Three, Prize winner? Uh, Nobel mm -hmm. Prize winner. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Journalist. But um, um, uh, the Greek title of this book was The End of the Red Man. And uh, but but uh, the Russian title is precisely the uh, similar with English, Vremia second hand, Vremia second hand, second hand time. And then you realize um, somehow to serve the way modern divided meta Soviet man uh, understands and uh, accepts all these things which is really dangerous mm -hmm. because what they have lost, Soviet empire, has to be somehow regained, you know. They are trying to find a way mm. to gain back what they lost. This is why Dugan's idea can be absolutely dangerous. So he's, he's uh, in saying that, uh, you know, Russia is the catacomb, this is not the old, you know, the old religion, the Orthodox Church oh, yeah, coming Russia, back. The Russia that cannot, cannot live in a, in, a, in a democratic way. The Russians who are not able to be informed, you know, what happens in the war in, in Ukraine today, what Russia? The Russia which, which is led somehow without being able to understand and to know exactly where it is led and by whom and for what reason. Yeah. What Russia? Uh, if you read this book, and I think that's, um, uh, that book helped me very, very well to understand um, um, the danger of these ideas. These are not started from Dugin, they started from Solzhenitsyn indeed. Mm -hmm. Solzhenitsyn yeah. is the first author of such. Uh, in a sense, uh, Dugin and Solzhenitsyn and many others have to understand that the katechon, the katechon, the katechon, it's a Greek word, mm -hmm. Is the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and not the nation, one nation or another nation. Otherwise, this can be uh, sheer nationalism. Mm -hmm. And I, as an Orthodox, as an Orthodox theologian, 
I am afraid that this is a very bad witness of orthodoxy for, for the modern world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm actually afraid yeah, that, possessors, yeah. Possessor, it is, if they possess the Holy Spirit, they possess the Holy Spirit themselves. Mm -hmm. This is the katechon, katechon in Greek. You know Greek, mm -hmm. and you know katechon is that I possess, I katecho, I Techo, yeah. possess, katecho. I have this absolutely me, I possess it, precisely. So, if the possessor is Russia, okay how uh, yeah, inaccurate, how can I say, uh, non -satisf unsatisfied, I mean, um, how, how, how inadequate witness of, 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 of orthodox uh, uh, theology and ecclesiology this could, can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they, if, if, if Dukin was saying the, that this is a servant or a spirit who want him to possess creation, things would be different. But let me let me say in my book on ecclesiology, for the ecclesiology, I have dedicated a chapter to Homyakov. Homyakov's ecclesiology is um, inadequate for the same reason because he practically identifies the ideal ecclesial community, the parish, with the mere, the, 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 the land, the, the, the village, mm -hmm. you know. So the perfect Christian, the Russian villager, are precisely the same person. So these ideas are very old, not new. Is this Russian universalism? Some other very important Russians try to deny, deny, and, 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 and this denial was, you know, exercised by many, both from uh, Florovsky, for example, by Florovsky, and by Bulgakov, okay? Mm -hmm. When Florovsky speaks of this Greek Orthodox, uh, Greek patristic background of Orthodoxy, he tries to heal Russia precisely from this nationalism. Mm -hmm. Do you think this because is conscious that, in Dugan? Do you think this is a conscious effort or he's, you know, um, I can trace it in, 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 the Russian, in the Russian past very easily. Mm -hmm. I spoke already of Komyakov, the Slavophiles. Mm -hmm. There are many. Many of them are very interesting people, but. Uh, uh, even uh, 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 the Russian, the Russian um, uh, historians of philosophy, like Basil Zerkovsky, for Zerkovsky, for example, you read his double volume, uh, Histoire de la Philosophie Russe, which is only in French, as far as I know, you will see, you will see a very accurate criticism of all these tensions, the tendencies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Zinkovsky and of course Florovsky in his uh, two volume Ways of Russian Theology has criticized very accurately. So this is wonderful that this, this is the glorious part of Russian thought, you know, mm -hmm. the most important for all of us. In this way, Russia becomes pan-Christian. We could say that Russia in this way can be the possessor, but it's, it, it is us who say this. If you say this of yourself, you become dangerous then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he's very, uh, what he's doing now, he's wrote this book, I uh, forgot what it was called, talking about that uh, he's fighting the transhumanist globalist cabal that wants to expedite and export gender ideology, all these political, you know, um, so his, his critique is, is accurate. I think there's a lot of strangeness that's happening that the West is exporting to different parts of the world, right? So he takes this, this I think, accurate um, and sound critique. And he then he gives a solution that I think he sneaks in there that is, is to, the, um, to what you're saying, where he's sneaking in this kind of political, uh, you know, political response to, uh, to this situation. I guess in the, in, to kind of close out here, how can we think of the, you know, the revelation, this, the second coming? I know it's, it's, you know, how can we think of the political Christian versus the, you know, we can't, we don't know when the end times are going to come. How do we think of it 
what it's going to look like politically. How can we orient ourselves in terms of politics as Orthodox Christians uh, towards the world? You know. In the book of the book of Abishkhasar Vladimir, there is another chapter on this on uh, political uh, eschatology. Mm. And um, perhaps if sometime discuss this book, we can spend um, some time discussing precisely this. How can uh, eschatology, political eschatology, become anthropocentric? Mm. Mm -hmm. not, and not nationalistic anymore. Mm -hmm. The problem is precisely when this political eschatology, one of the problems, is becomes nationalistic. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we have all this political enhancement of human nature, mm -hmm. which is a, a post-enlightenment uh, way of thinking of humans, but created totalitarianism. Mm -hmm. Okay, I have a book in Greek, which is not, for the moment at least in English, it is, it is called um, The Open History and Its Enemies. The subtitle is The Rise of the Velvet Totalitarianism. You said you have that in English? No, no, it's not in English, it's only in Greek. Okay. But it's been translated, I hope that it would appear, appear in English, um, which is a book on political philosophy, precisely what we, we, we are talking about. What and does that velvet totalitarianism mean? That's, it's a, something, a term that I have created. Yeah. It's the new, the coming totalitarian. You know, if you read Haldus Huxley, for example, you see that, uh, and uh, partially even, you know, uh, even, even uh, George Orwell, you will see that uh, this sort of totalitarianism that we knew already, it was a totalitarianism that's depressing uh, some dimensions of human being as desire, sentiment, uh, the embodied life, and all these things. Um, in this sense, uh, totalitarianism of the past was so aggressive and against all these things and other things that are connected with it. And uh, Alexei can help you to understand this, can help you understand that precisely this. The new totalitarianism that's coming, it's a uh, velvet totalitarianism. It gives priority to all these things. And it, this happens through our consent. This is a new sort that I'm seeing coming and I hope this book that will be easily uh, 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 soon ready for publication. Um, I would say it's, it's here. It's not coming. It's here. It's here already. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for this. It's yeah. here already. Uh, if you see the characteristics, you, 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 you will realize that this, this, this is uh, uh, already here. But mm -hmm. in, 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 in this sense, all these narratives, who um, uh, somehow um, uh, uh, speak of a, of a nation or of a group of people, this idealized way, um, uh, want to some, somehow uh, make a comment upon this uh, possibility. We're going to give a reason, a raison d'etre in this world. But, once again, we have to be very careful because both the problem and the solution can become absolutely problematic in this sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you see, I see that. that. What I want to say is that Dugin has not understand what the problem is today. And they speak in, in terms of the, in the Hegelian terms. Mm -hmm. This is why it's my, the, the first chapter of this book of mine, is precisely a discussion between Thomas Aquinas and Hegel, mm -hmm. created grace and cosmic logos. Mm. Uh, yes, to see how the modern setting of the self-justified history was created. The problem with modern uh, understanding of history is this, is, is this, this it is self-justified, but this creates both the ten tendency toward the, this velvet totalitarianism and the wrong solution mm. of a self justification in history. We are the possessors of truth. You understand? Mm -hmm. This way, the one is the form is the alibi of, 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 of the latter. And we have this terrible double bind 
double impulse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see how things are difficult. And, 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 and in this sense, we need once again theology, but this sort of theology, this theological reciprocity, this Eucharistic understanding of things where all we are, so we are serving the one, one another. And in this sense, um, we try to invent the other others, to help the other others to, 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 to flourish. In this book, book which is in, in English also, the prophetic ecclesiology, I find as the very essence of every charisma, the fact that it lets all, let, let is letting all the others to flourish. Mm -hmm. And it's where you have consubstantiality in each charisma, everything, all, all the other charisma exist in one of them. Mm -hmm. So you see how ecclesiology, political theory, <laughs> so many other things are interconnected uh, in, in, in the real life because it really makes, you know, separate compartments, you know, things, but they're not true. <clears throat> yes, the situation is pragmatic. This is, 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 the situation is in, um, indeed very difficult precisely because um, the Orthodox theologians have, in a sense, failed so far to analyze correctly. What has happened in the West, mm -hmm. and without it, it just uh, you know that I speak of a Greek Western world, uh, mm -hmm. Christian Western world within the same world. Uh, all these things happen, but uh, there are very important things to be said in order to analyze situation uh, in the situation. But <clears throat> yes, so I think uh, that will be a great place for us to start next time. If you would be uh, interested, I'm going to. Yes, I'd like to, and you, you would perhaps, because precisely because I mentioned that book already published some five or six years ago with St. Vladimir's Press, we can start from this talking about ecclesia and politics. Yes, and then I think this, what we're, we didn't get to this time, I wanted to talk to you, and I think this will fit in nicely next time about uh, the subject versus the gifted, right? Because the subject is a, a, a political category in terms of what is a human being in a system. And this idea of, of a gifted instead of a subject really, you know, was a beautiful way of orienting ourselves. I don't want to speak of myself, but in, in, in um, <coughs> the, my coming book, the second volume of Analogical Identities, I deal precisely with this and I discuss with Jean Luc Marion, mm. uh, precisely on this topic, which is a very valuable idea, but it, I try to go even further. Um, so we have things to discuss there, James. And, uh, sure. I'm very happy for these discussions. I hope that the, your audience there will find them useful. Yeah, yeah. I'm very appreciative of, uh, of your time and they love the first video. Um, I actually had some emails come out and they're definitely gonna love this one. I, I found it beautiful, edifying, uh, and, and I'm very appreciative of your time. Um, so I will, uh, I'll post this in, um, you know, probably within the next couple of days, I'll send you a link. Um, and then we can set up a time to continue the discussion in the more, you know, political territory, I think is needs to happen, but not in the Dugan sense, you know, there needs to be another orientation. Absolutely. Yes, but politics is absolutely important, but we need an anthropocentric eschatological politics, which is can be derived from theology indeed, but uh, we have to uh, make some very careful steps in order to describe it. Otherwise, you know, things can become very, very difficult as they are today. Yes. They are today. We are in impasse. And there are very few people who understand today that the impasse, it's not just, uh, uh, just, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's first of all, a, a spiritual impasse. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. Then we can Behind what up. happens today, it is a, a, a bad interpretation of things, a bad understanding, an incomplete analysis, an incomplete analysis. This is what I believe. Yeah. And I, I don't think that Dugin has understood what happened in the Enlightenment. Enlightenment mm -hmm. has also positive dimensions. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
That's a good point. What is negative is something that we have to discuss. In my book, I'm trying step by step to offer my own explanation. Um, my Greek book, I mean, uh, starting from the ambiguities created by the term of uh, nature in, in a post enlightenment, a pre enlightenment, and in a post enlightenment period. But it has to be discussed in detail, you know, in order to see how things uh, uh, went and for, for perhaps for what reason, for what reason. This is why we need all these understandings for this of course, Maximus. Nature, and you have somehow this to put in this, in this video, is dialogical. Mm -hmm. In this uh, uh, book, I criticize my mentor, John Gisulas, and some others. Precisely because of this, because they feel they say that nature is a burden or necessity, where a person, <clears throat> okay, was somehow for an unknown reason, freedom, why a person's freedom? I don't understand that. It is the person who sins, not nature. Mm -hmm. Person is freedom, but this does not mean that this, this, this is the Holy, it possesses the Holy Spirit, because it's, it's you know, Maximus does not divide person from nature. Mm -hmm. Nature is only personally constituted precisely because it is the content of a dialogue between persons. Mm -hmm. What do you want to be do you want to become? This is a question that God, you know, poses to, to poses to us. Okay. Yeah. To us. Wonderful. What is the, I mean, in this sense, nature and, 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 and the world's nature, uh, along with human nature, are the content of a constant dialogue that means nature is personally constituted. We understand nature and we act upon nature and we receive information from nature or not. Okay, it, you cannot say that nature is here and person is there. It's always what we do with nature, mm -hmm. what nature is finally, what nature yeah. becomes. Or, okay. So, yes, yes. And this is another reason for Maximus to, um, to see how, how important Maximus is, how important it is. Because all these divisions of body, soul, uh, nature, will, uh, will say, natural, uh, personal will, uh, person, nature, all these things, all these, all these things are put, you know, together in his thought. But that's because he does not know anything about the of all these modern, you know, dialectics, dialectic mm -hmm. divisions. No. Moreover, when he speaks of nature, he says that this is full of, 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 of God's intentions. In a sense, when you want to return to God, you have to look at nature. Mm -hmm. Find out that it is full of godly, godly intentions, divine intentions, which is which are the logi. So in a sense, you are not divided in yourself between what you are and what you think that you are. You have to return to what you really are in order to find what you can be. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Again, Plato and Aristotle are combined together. Okay, Wonderful. so Beautiful. let's put a semicolon. Yes. And we'll see. Thank you, Father. Okay. Thank you for your time. Till next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stop video.